Go ahead. Do I share? Go ahead, please, Erin. Yes, you're on. Oh, so you've got my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, love. Listen, this board that I've put up here, uh, you know, today what what we're going to talk about and prior to our, um, you know, setting up for the talk, I was just relating that um, for some reason the ancestral legacy, as I was sort of fantasizing it and had created a PowerPoint for, when I woke up this morning, I realized that I wanted to do another one, a different one. So I recreated this this morning. And um, unfortunately, that I'm very... I'm very happy with its results because um, the example that I had was fine and lovely, but I really have an excellent one for you guys today. There's this word epigenetic, and I just came across it not long ago, like a few weeks ago. And so I printed out um, a little blurb on it. It's called Epigenetics 101. Um, it's called A Beginner's Guide to Explaining Everything. And and there's claiming here, of course, that the word is everywhere, but of course it's only everywhere within a particular, you know, league of science, which is not ours. But it is in the league of what I'm talking about. And and I, I really am not I, I mean, you know, you can get books on Amazon for nothing now or ebooks and all of that. So my book on family dynamics is my my you know, apologia, if you will, my statement and my, my uh, support for families and tribes of all types of which we fall into it. So, you know, essentially our relationship, you'll see, it's so interesting, isn't it? Um, like what, what went on this morning is quite typical in my family. And so, you know, it's like, all right, who, who put that there and where and why? And <laughs> Okay, and where is it anyway, after all? And so I looked up epigenetic legacy and I printed out just a three-page thing, which I'm not going to read out, but I will explain what it is. And it's so irritating because why don't they start to read and learn astrology? Because all science is trying to do is reinvent the wheel. The wheel being, of course, the eternally turning image of the horoscope as it really is seen from Earth. Uh, yeah, you know, with the sun in the sky and the inner planets and all of that. Anyway, they write about epigenetics as um, a mysterious uh, DNA, and there's a it's called a histone with DNA, and it's a picture of a DNA um, that's wrapped in a kind of circle. And in the center of the circle, it's a double helix, of course, the DNA is wrapped around four histone proteins in a structure called a nucleosome. Okay, um, and they have to do with tags, molecular tags. Now, we all know so far that twins do not develop in the same way. I mean, identical twins. I mean, I have, they, they run in my, my son-in-law's family, and there is a point at which it's their, the way they receive their environment is going to tag uh, aspects upon the DNA structure, flagging it for, uh, to fire differently. So that by the time they're, you know, in their sort of like late 20s, 29, Saturn return, twins actually, um, they still might be giving each other the same, you know, fuzzy pink sweater for Christmas with the same wrapping paper. They still might be doing that. But their, their relationship issues, their whole, you know, dynamic towards um, dealing with the world around them is more, I think, impacted, if you will, by the uh, ancestral league and the many, many billions of billions of people that feed into our single little self. And this diagram I have here on the opening page here shows you, yeah? And then that's your fourth house. That's your house. That's your, your family, right? Well, it's not just your upline, your mother, father, their mother and father, their mother and father on into infinity or back to Alice or whomever was the first human being. But the fourth house, um, you know, is the container of your own family of origins, but also predisposes itself towards your family of uh, creation. So there's you in the middle of all this activity of upline, the family, 
and then downline your if you create a family like have children or you know literally by you know biological children because we'll find out that uh what they describe here in epigenetics and our experiences one sentence i will read any outside stimulus that can be detected by the body which is soma and the sixth house in the horoscope has the potential to cause epigenetic modifications oh wow it's not yet clear exactly which exposures affect which epigenetic marks nor what the mechanisms and downstream effects are but there are a number of quite well characterized examples from chemicals to lifestyle factors to lived experiences well the problem is they're always dealing with rats and stats they're not dealing with the evidence and the experience of empirical observation such as i have with families such as you have you know it's kind of like i mean i love this the, the new cover that wiser did for the, the second edition of family dynamics but um they there's one thing here it says childhood abuse for example childhood abuse and other forms of early trauma also seem to affect dna methylation patterns which may help to explain poor health that many victims of such abuse face for adulthood not least of which is drug abuse and ways of escaping going into neptune let me get back to god i want my soul yeah let's not be in the body let's go to the 12th house and so when i i worked on this um topic i i found this fabulous picture ages ago i store pictures like this um this is in fact a picture of us earth going round the sun and to sun and earth pointing at the center of the what would from our view the galactic center 25 6 26 degrees of sagittarius which happens to be opposite my uranus how interesting so i think that's a kind of incarnational picture don't you think it's it, it is a dna we are we are creating and have within us um the structures that we need to know as astrologers and the deep more deeply we go into it the more profoundly we are re realizing exactly how we have uh you know got information that you know has been known for you know on many levels i mean when they talk for instance about research on the epigenetic inheritance of addictive behavior it's not advanced well you know all you have to do is look at your family and then your grandparents and then or ask some questions i mean addictions are different you know one might have a shopping addiction another one might have i'm, I'm late i'm always late addiction um sorry uh another one is addicted to drugs another one might have you know as a result you know my say my father was you know my both my parents were like poor things ended up just absolutely disgustingly alcoholic just sickening and i am not an alcoholic i have the great good fortune of one of the last trucks that i, that I use is i can have a couple glasses of wine at night i i, I really like that i made that that you know as i've been through the 60s and all my whole most fascinating and wildly active life um i decided that at one point when i because i never drank wine until i i never even had alcohol to speak of until i was like in my 30s in my post saturn return and and then you know it got a little more classy in the 80s and you know things started looking and it was champagne and wine and i thought you know i think that i would like to have one drug of choice at the end of my life and one would be pot and the other one would be glasses of wine and so here i am almost 70 and the queen mother is still having her double g and t every night and uh and she's almost 100 so i'm thinking you know maybe there's hope i can I, ha I get to keep a couple of addictions as well as um obsessive compulsive <laughs> behaviors <laughs> But then how do you think people get smart okay let's get back to astrology and not me i put this picture up just as emblazoned in your mind that we're really going to be dealing with three houses just to make life a little easier and 
In order to make it easier, I just picked out the four houses that in family dynamics, and I've just been reading parts of it again. I, I cannot tell you how amazed. It's as if I've read it. I've never read it before. And I often find that. And, and what I did find was that the fourth house, as I said earlier, is your family dynamic. Your mother, your father, their mother, father, on back through the line. The eighth house is lateral ancestors like cousins, aunts, uncles, people who are kind of uh, exiting out from the central force. And the twelfth house, I have always been fascinated with Neptune. When I first began astrology, I didn't have any I mean Neptune is definitely what it is like it's invisible it's it's shape-shifting it's difficult to describe how do you use words well you know I happen to really love words and um, I have found loads of them for it but when I was first studying and I had all the you know sort of the few books that were out one was Rex Bills's um, keywords and everybody had it and everybody has it and should have read it anyway but under Neptune <laughs> there were like vague, nebulous, undecided, um, invisible, unseen, uncertain. And I thought, oh, that's really helpful. I mean, what am I supposed to do with that? So then I have to spend sort of 30 years, you know, uh, keeping Rex Bills in mind and saying, you know what, I'm going to find out something hard, more hardcore about this. Now, Neptune is all of those things, though, right? But it also deals with the dimension beyond the physical. And it, the 12th house has to do with our ancestral league, because this is your mom and your dad and everybody else up line, grandma and grandpa and so on. Pluto's your aunts and uncles and cousins. Scorpio, the 8th house. And then Neptune, the 12th house, is your ancestral league. But it's also the collective unconscious. And therefore, we are A, a human being with a soul that goes back to the beginning of time. However, that we see it shape shifting. It's quite fine with me how anybody thinks of it. And it is also your immediate ancestral connection to your ancestral league in your family. And it can show actual physical and, and historical things, but it's also your, um, your, your psychic connection to your family, historically. So that maybe your parents weren't alcoholics, but maybe your grandfather or your great-grandfather uh, was, or your grandmother. I mean, the secret drinkers of women in, the, in, in you know, previous generations, like three generations back, was really high. I mean, when Bill W., formed Alcoholics Anonymous, it was for men. Um, but now, of course, we have like incredible branches of AAs of all different kinds, and it includes women, but women weren't, weren't included in the, in the sort of recovery programs. It, it was still hidden that women were drunks or they took laudanum or, you know, or that they were hooked on, on happy pills. I mean, you know, thy neighbor's wife guy gay, by day gay Talese in the 60s really had a, a big statement to make about, you know, women. And also, you know, the pill taking, mummy's little helpers. You know, women are easily uh, addicted just as well as men, as are young people, and it's never too late. And that's something I do tell my, I have told my kids. And also now my grandchildren who are between the ages of 16 and 21 is, you know, kids, it's never too late. It's never too late to become a drug addict, an alcoholic or anything because it runs in the family. And they said, oh, yeah, mom's, mom told us. And I went, of course, because we, we talk. Our generation talks. Nobody has talked until this generation. So that's why I put that picture up to make it really simple because the moon is our natal family. This is the eighth house, sorry, the fourth house is our natal family and our family downline. Eighth house is our, um, our lateral family. And the, and the twelfth house is our ancestral family. So it's 
all of ever extensive, extensive humans from a millennia ago as well. Um, going back to the origins of, of Homo sapiens or even before. I mean, you know, we're maybe related to an, an, an Neanderthal. Um, indeed, maybe one of our old families. Why are people interested in that kind of thing? Why do people study archaeology? Why do people study, um, you know, the heavens? Why did Carl Sagan take it upon himself to be so incredibly and deeply involved in, um, you know, not only being a rigorous scientist, but not only that, but, you know, a, a popularizer and one of the 186 scientists in the 80s who opposed and signed an edict against astrology, he did not sign. So wonder why? Was he burned at the stake? Did he tell on somebody? Was he, you know, sort of, you know, one of the grand inquisitors? I don't know. We all have a debt. I mean, Nick Campy and I once were walking out on a promontory out near Brighton and in England, and um, and we were feeling quite good. And we were looking at the uh, out at the ocean and watching the waves come in and the tide go out and all of that. And he said, what on earth is it that presents possessed us to become astrologers and I said well you know maybe we did something really horrible in a past life like maybe I've always thought I might have been um, Cardinal Richelieu and he said oh I was Torquemada and I went ah there you go that's why we're paying our debts <laughs> so we have to pay our debts to astrology here's just a, a quickie I've actually shown this a few times but I'm just going to say this is a really quick one and it's it and and who was I speaking to earlier? Who was born right during this period of time? This is the moment in time that we are now praying would just come back so we could do it again. I mean, the EPA was signed in 1972, and now they've taken it away. The Environmental Protection Action, and they've just shown it on my news on my iPhone this morning. There's a Russian um, uh, icebreaker going through. Uh, taking stuff down and there's no ice to break it's the first time ever so there's there's uh, you know we're really looking at a long-term thing that we all saw under this aspect okay so this is actually a, a client however this is a global aspect that took place in the time um, that I have selected here February of 1965 it, it looks to me like the sort of epitany epiphany oh that's a good word uh, for the uh, for this sort of uh, revolution. The reason I'm doing it because is that this is part of him. His moon, his fourth house, his family, his moon is in Taurus, conjunct Jupiter, opposite Neptune. Okay, what's really interesting is that he has always loved, he, he's a, a very, a very fabulous man, very, very bright, always a very hard consciousness worker as well as a, a incredible uh, legal he's a lawyer. And his spiritual work is intense. His whole dynamic seems to be bound upon breaking the rage that lies within him. And I'm going, okay, take that rage, go to the courtroom and give them hell and win your case. I mean, there's always ways that physically we can work it out. But how do we work it out in our souls when your moon is opposite Neptune from your family? Big secrets, lots of secrets in the family. He was an Aquarius person born with the T-cross to the Neptune as well, right? And so his Aquarius part splits off and, and actually can, you know, really look at things very objectively whilst he's still in this sort of turmoil internally. It's an interesting combination, Aquarius. I think that's one of the talks that I really liked that, that um, my colleague did for here in Santa Fe about the Aquarian split. And so he comes out of a family that was basically what I would call enmeshed, as it, in my Family Dynamics book, Moon, Neptune, Neptunian family is enmeshed. And the emotional nature is governed basically by the maternal or the feminine function. And he has a very, very gentle, tender side to himself, but he also has this raging bull. I mean, he's a great, a great athlete as well. 
and so are his sons. And so he has a family dynamic that's a smothering, okay, that's all enveloping, that has some kind of secret history. Part of that secret history probably has to do with the fact that they're Jews, but they're non-practicing Jews. They're not, you know, involved in anything. It's, they're just social Jews. In other words, you know, it, it is part of their makeup. However, they do live in a part of the uh, United States which doesn't really have a lot of Jewish um, activity going on, so they don't do that. He has taken it upon himself, however, to have this most incredible inscription on his legal, on his wall in his office, that it's all in Hebrew, and it's about, and it's about his name. I just love it. So his name, his name is very important. So there's the moon, Neptune, and the planet Pluto involved with Saturn, and Pluto is the natural ruler, as I, you know, of the eighth house. The moon is the natural ruler of the fourth house, and Neptune is the natural ruler of the twelfth house, and he's got Chiron and Pisces. So there is, and it's exactly opposite to Pluto. So we're looking again at something that is very much karmically tied in. Pluto is square the nodal axis, right? And you're going to see this in, in the chart I'm going to show you next, which is really a story. But he's got Pluto square along with a long, sorry, I might tell. Two, you know, technology is fabulous. Let me just turn my phone off. Right. And so all right, so, so far, because even though I have no contact with you guys, is there anything that anybody, you know, is this good enough for now, just to give a quick point out? I'm sure you're all sharp enough to have picked up what I talked about. Yep, I'm with you. Okay. I really should. Okay. All right, this is a dedication. This is to my very best friend ever in my entire world of life. And his horoscope is phenomenal. His ancestral legacy is profound. His life is amazing. And his you know, dying in a time when men and women, because they never again talk about the, the junky women that died of AIDS, but he died of AIDS and he was, he made his choice, you know, like he was at the hospital, he'd had enough, he'd gone and given his last seminar at the Washington United Astrology Conference in uh, DC um, that ape, ape it would have been, I guess, April, just before his birthday. And then we had to fly home really fast because he was, he was fading. We put him into the hospital and, and, uh, and then he died. And, and he chose his death really because he could have just lingered for a while. And of course, we were all called in to discuss what did we want. We wanted just uh, comfort and palliative care. But it's sort of cute, really, and I don't mind sharing this with everyone. And that is that... Um, the nurse had come in and found him in the morning. He wasn't in bed, and so they're like racing into the little, because they had little toilets in the in Middlesex Hospital. It had a special AIDS ward. It was just very, very advanced in England in those days, in, in the 90s. Very advanced, way, way better than here. And he had gone into the bathroom, and Howard and I had talked a lot about when he was going to die, because the transit of the planet Pluto was like going back and forth his 12, 10th house, three times exactly stationing on it three times and and we all know anybody who's read retrograde planets knows that whenever the outer planet is retrograde the sun is always in the opposition zone in the sky so that when the opposite and the sun moves one degree a day you know sort of, sort of 59 degrees to one degree 59 minutes to one degree two minutes um every single day and so therefore it it actually has like almost a, a three-month regular 
to four months, well, it's actually four and a half months, of retrogression of an outer planet beyond this, the planet Pluto, uh, Jupiter, okay? So when Pluto's going back and forth, the sun is trekking slowly day by day to the point where it will actually reach his IC opposite the transit of Pluto, calling it, I call it the flashpoint. Well, just to precede his life, he died on May 12th, 1992, with the transiting sun on his IC of the end of the matter in old-fashioned astrology, opposite Pluto at his midheaven. His vocation was complete. So it was perfect timing. And this is a picture I took of him in the Sydney Harbor because <clears throat> he'd always wanted to go to Australia, so I quickly whipped together with a colleague of mine down there, um, you know, kind of pushed ourselves into speaking at the conference that January of 92 of uh, doing seminars down in Melbourne with uh, Glennis Lawton and, and um, oh, my dear friend from my Canadian, why am I forgetting the husband's name? He's my old, old friend from Canada. Anyway, uh, we were teaching at Chiron Center down there, Chiron Center, just totally symbolic. And we just had an absolute blast. And he got to go to Australia. We came back and in that time frame it was evident that we would go to this conference, the UI conference, and he had done everything he ever wanted to do. And so he was memorialized and I just loved that. I wanted to show that sweet thing. November of eighty nine. Okay. Here we have a legacy. I mean, first of all, in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell talks a lot about the treasure from the ancestral family. And in Howard's life, um, his intellectual prowess wasn't immediately evident. In fact, one night when um, we were visiting from England to Connecticut, to Hartford, where his parents lived, from one very wonderfully casual moment in time, um, is his father was, you know, typically Jewish, quiet man. Mother was like absolutely Jewish woman, wife. Yeah, I mean, truly she was. I mean, it, it just is such a classic ar archetype, delightful, but also incredibly irritating at times because nobody could get a word in edgewise, least of all her husband. So anyway, so Howard and I are, I'm lying on the bed and Howard's slouching over in a chair and they're lying on the bed. And you know, there, his dad said, Max, his dad, who lived to be a hundred, um, he said, you know, I've got to ask you guys this. Why are such intelligent people involved and in wasting your minds on something like astrology? And Howard said, well, that's hard to explain because we aren't wasting our minds. And um, it's the only thing that, you know, that I was called, he was called toward. And it seems evident that that's exactly what we're doing. Well, look at Howard's chart. Moon in Taurus opposite Chiron. And his moon in the fourth house. It's exactly squaring Mars and Saturn and Pluto. And so part of, and I'm just going to run through this a bit. He also has the planet Saturn ruling his 12th house, which is part of the square from the family home dynamic. Um, the planet Neptune is being opposed by Mercury, but at the midpoint, um, close to the midpoint anyway, is of Sun Mercury, the mind and the, the intellect and the investment of one's resources is opposite Neptune in the eighth house. There isn't one house that isn't implicated in something really profound and possibly even mysterious that takes place in the ancestral realm. Now, the thing about Howard is he goes back a long way. Um, let me just try and move this thing again. There we go. As it says here, um, it's a legacy that leads back to the ancient Hebrew world. 
he is an example of direct lineage through the parental line, in particular his father, uh, Sasportis. The mother's background is not really great. She doesn't know when she was born or where. Her mother was fleeing uh, from the Russian Revolution of the, of the um, you know, 1918, 20s in that time frame. And I think she was born trapped in a, in a, uh, a fence and gave birth to in the snow as they crossed the board the border out of Russia and arrives to Ellis Island and settled in Connecticut where she eventually met her lifelong husband who is the, the def descendant of Jacob Sisportis, the rabbi. Now the story of Jacob Sisportis is uh, there is a, a major link to it and it's I did all this research when we buried Howard. We buried him in Golders Green, which is the oldest um, uh, Jewish Arab sacred site, site and uh, cemetery in England. And so, and that's where he wanted to be. And so we took him there and had his funeral there. And he was, you know, he, he rests there. And some of his ashes we took back over to Connecticut so that they could sit in the with on the stone on the stone, um, and his family, his uh, this is for his family um, compound in the in in their uh, one in Connecticut. But in Golders Green, um, it's really interesting because. And it's when I started writing something about Howard Sisportis' heroic journey, which actually is in one of the British AA journal magazines as an article, but I also did one on his heroic journey. I wrote a, a, a prefix to the um, the houses too, uh, as a when it was reprinted by Flair, and he asked me if I'd write the. The, what do they call that, the sort of introduction. And I did that. But here's the thing. This word up here is the Hebrew word for tzaddik. Now, a tzaddik is not your ordinary wise man. A tzaddik is a teacher. He's a benevolent and, and absolutely, utterly invested human being in the spiritual, metaphysical, and religious doctrine, all three rolled into one, becomes a wise man. And so a tzaddik is a wise man who teaches. And that's exactly what Howard was. And I didn't know that until he died, until I started really soothing myself by doing hundreds of horoscopes and trying to figure everything out and, you know, what, what, what was all this about. And I still don't really know. However, I do know that uh, being a tzaddik, as a wise teacher, his great, great, great something, uh, grandfather, Jacob Sasportis, was a Sephardim, a Jew from the Iberian Peninsula. A Sephardim are also Arabic, okay? And so it, it's very interesting that, that Howard's um, appearance was, I mean, he was kind of a classical Jew, but at the same time, there was an Arabic uh, tone to his, 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 um, his complexion. And there was also a kind of, I mean, he had this uh, incredibly fabulous wit that, which I think his father had, but his mother never let him get it worded edgewise, so he was never able to get the joke out on time. And <laughs> But Howard was absolutely wicked. I mean, everybody thinks, wow, what a loving spiritual man. Well, if you had moon in the fourth house in Taurus, square Pluto, Saturn, and Mars, that is not really very loving. It's actually wicked as hell. And we used to have a riot. I mean, we would wet ourselves laughing with our black humor. It was just constant. One day we were stumbling along as he was walking on his cane by this time, just around the corner from where he lived and where I lived and where his best friend from school lived from Connecticut. And, you know, he was pretty sick. And so we were like talking about, 
uh, we were trying to make a game out of reading, interpreting, I know, we wanted to interpret the meaning of uh, real estate signs. And so we were doing that. And then we came along a great big dumpster, right? What they call, um, yeah, a dumpster or a, a big garbage dump thing you, know, you put in the street for throwing uh, big trash. And we said, okay, the answer to the question, this is a riddle because we were, had fought, come to this very questioning point. And I said, the answer to the question will be, one of us will reach in and the first thing that we get out of the dumpster, we will read and it will be the answer. And so we, he reached in, didn't look, handed it to me. I looked at it. It was an envelope addressed to the nasty suicides, which was obviously a punk rock band, I guess. And well, we just about, we just fell about laughing. I mean, we were in hysterics. By the time we got to, to uh, our friend's house, he opened the door and he got, oh God, now what have you guys been up to? And we said, well, here, we're looking at this. And he says, no, 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 we'll not have any nasty suicides here today. And I said, well, that's fine, because it's all just a joke anyway. So this sort of inherited wit and humor is very typically, in a way, I mean, there's a certain humor, you know, that Jews have that other, other uh, ethnicities do not. And um, except for some of the Irish, they have a similar kind of a thing. But his grandfather, great, 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 um, he was actually sent off in the mid-1600s in the Armada of Queen Isabella. Um, and in 1653, he arrived in England, Jacob Sasportis. He was made a rabbi, and just after the death of Cromwell, but still under the Cromwell's edict of freedom of worship. Now, this is one thing. We hear all sorts of terrible things about Cromwell. But the fact is, is that England, at that point, harbored, like Grenada did at one point, Grenada, uh, all three you know, Jewish, the uh, Islamic, and um, the uh, Christians. God, I forgot about those guys. <laughs> anyway, so the, all three were were had freedom. They could have their churches, they could have their synagogues, and they could have their, their mosques. And so he was the first of the rabbis, actually. He was the first rabbi in England. And he founded Golders Green, as I mentioned. And the the synagogue there. However, in, 15, in 1656, he had to, he fled to Amsterdam where many of the Jews did actually go. So there's a huge Jewish contingent in Holland. And there's some stories about that, by the way, that are current, um, might be worth looking into if you're interested. And so having a Howard's ashes put around this, um, stone in the Golders Green Cemetery after the funeral celebrating his remarkable life. Um, it just seems so appropriate, but I didn't know any of this until much later. Hang on. Whoops. I'm not finished yet. Okay, so more about Howard. Get rid of these sidebars here. So when I look at the chart... I'm seeing almost every signature that shows an ancient connection, moon, square, Saturn, ruler of the 12th house, Neptune of the ancestral league, the ancestral souls. Also, Judaism is claims to be, well, and I certainly don't know, the oldest religion in the biblical sense, in the sense of having it written. Um, we're really now into the, I think it's 566 years this year. Um, and they date that to uh, to the beginning of, of Judaism. And so we're looking at the oldest religion, moon, square, Saturn, old religion, ruler of the 12th, linked to a very heavy past. Jews have been been, been sort of pushed all over the world. They are the wanderers, right? And of course, Howard defected 
from his own homeland, yeah, because of the, the, the sort of scorpionic wound. We have Pluto exactly square his nodal axis, and the, the sort of karmic connection to that, especially with Saturn and Pluto, is that he was born out of World War II really pissed off. So, you know, he and I actually discussed this business of him going being in the ovens before he was born, because he was born in 48, right? You know, I was born in 47. I know I rose up off of the battlefield of World War II really, really angry. And, you know, which is why a whole lot of our generation did. The, the sort of baby boomers, you know, were, were definitely there. And so he was born out of a historical past, historical, not just mythological past, where there was death and destruction, annihilation by forces not even imaginable. But if you know what, what rules gas, Neptune. And he has Neptune in Libra, as his, our generation does, uh, which is the ruler of his 12th house naturally, but it's also involved with Saturn as a sextile, and Neptune's in the 8th house of death. So his whole his thing about being gassed in a previous life, I believe it. I also believe that, that his, you know, the, the, the whole story about his parental heritage shows a tremendous amount of wounding. And Howard was interesting because when his dad had asked us about what, why, why did you choose astrology, we said, we didn't choose astrology, it just became part of what we do. And, and it's an ancient tradition. It's something that, you know, that we really love. And, and the parents were happy with that. I mean, they were perfectly, they were, inter, they were sincerely and for the first time, according to Howard, actually interested. Because, you see, they thought that I was, they, they liked to, to fantasize that I was Howard's girlfriend and that they would tell him, their friends, their other Jewish friends in Connecticut, in Hartford, um, Howard's fiance is visiting us, which we thought was terribly cute because, of course, Howard was gay. There's no way. I mean, we loved each other passionately. And if he hadn't been gay and had AIDS, maybe something would have been different. But it wasn't. And that's, that's fine with me because, you know, sexuality, you know, can really destroy a relationship because it puts territorialism. So Howard and I had a, a very profound, deep love, family love, you know, very much in the family, Venus and Gemini. But it was asexual. Yeah, it was non-territorial. His connection to his past lives and his lifestyle in the current one is also heretical. I mean, look what happened to even as recently as Oscar Wilde. He never wrote a damn thing after De Profundis, which was, he was, was written in Reading Gale after he had been put in uh, prison for um, sodomy. Excuse me, Erin, we have 10 minutes left. Oh, that's great. Does anyone, can anyone comment on this? I'd love it if people like just said something that they'd like to say about this horoscope and about Howard and his contribution. Because, I mean, with Venus and Gemini, obviously, you know, uh, he was writing about families, writing about families. He was completely and utterly obsessed with families. Well, most Jews are. And so are anyone who's been abused. Now, he wasn't abused. His mother was a shopping addict. You should, she had a whole room full of clothes, none of which he wore. I mean, it was hilarious. Um, his father was a, a, a paper hanger. And, you know, he was already hoping that his son might take over his business. But Howard had short, thick, stubby fingers. And he didn't even have shoes that could tie up because he couldn't. He was completely and totally incapable of doing anything with his fingers except write and type and to think. And that was where his, his whole life was, was fourth house legacy. Somewhere down the line, he got the mind of a, of a genius, Venus, Sextile, Pluto, and the planet Mercury in Aries, five Aries, exactly trine Pluto, ruler of his eighth house, and also ruler of his fifth house of creativity. Wherein we find Uranus. So he was obviously very different in his uh, 
way of relating and also uh, he wanted freedom from family yeah because that was an important function for him so anybody have any questions about what I've been talking here about Howard and his chart yes hello yes um, I have loved like readings Howard says Porta he has been my first the first author that I really connect with and I was you know I've learned astrology with him I oh really, Marie that's so wonderful to hear he, he's listening to you now well I mean I thought he was just incredible I was curious in his chart about yeah the, uh, Mars Saturn and Pluto they are intersected there is oh. no uh you know what? Let me just interrupt you right there. There's no such thing as interception. Just look at it. It's a big house. The first house and the eighth house, seventh house, are enlarged based upon a, you know, an accident of location and season. Now, interception was invented by some astrologer sitting in a basement, never seeing the sky, not even considering the possibility of what really was going on. I mean, that's where we had to come out of. We had to come out of the dark ages. So what, what we have here with, with real positioned houses, which is why I don't use equal houses, and I really do believe in the angles. I not necessarily am wedded to the house system, but I am wedded to the angles. Those are the most important parts, the, the horizon and the midheaven. When they're at an angle this tight, in other words, a sextile between the midheaven and the ascendant rather than a square, if you were born at the equator, you end up with getting an enlarged house. What that means, an in, or an intercepted house, what it truly means is, let's just say that you have the transit of Saturn going on in your chart, and it's transiting through Capricorn, it goes through there too, every, you know, so that's about two and two years, two and a quarter years, and then it hits the ascendant, and then it spends not only two and a half years, but a whole nother year. So it spends three and a half years in the first house transiting, and then zoom, 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 and then three and a half years in the seventh. So it's, it's, it's where uh, size equals time and duration. And so I've really taken a long time to come to this, 50 years of, of thinking and using intercepted houses, like tr drawing the little sort of line in here. And, you know, when we didn't have this kind of an image in the olden days, when in the 60s, when we were learning astrology. So I'm not meaning rude when I said there are no such thing as intercepted houses. I'm being really stern to say i want you to open your mind to think okay these two houses because they're you know balanced they must be considered as the most important lesson in the chart because anything transiting them spends more time in those two houses than in any other house of the horoscope so howard's biggest lessons were himself and understanding his aquarianness Uranus and his seventh house of relationships and having uh, and having some very interesting and unusual relationship uh, ways of being um, you know had a couple of very solid partners in his life like really long-term relationships but very often particularly gay men they don't have this issue about um, uh, monogamy in fact, Jim Lewis used to tell me that, you know, Hate Street or the, 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 the Castro district was full of guys staring up at the sky saying, oh, I want to meet the right one. <laughs> and they're not even looking at any of the guys on the street. And so Howard um, had a normal, what I would say, a normal homosexual life. And that is, is that he and his partner had other guys over for the night or something like that. Um, and so that you know, Mars, Saturn, Pluto, that would be considered a social anomaly. I mean, that's absolutely unthinkable. Oh, my God. Tr threesomes between men help. Uh, so that's part of what the vertex, which is cosmic encounters, and one of them I'll tell you because it's really good and he'd love it, is, is that there was always this guy in, in, um, in the, at the Heath in the English, English Big Park, 
that it was so handsome that he just thought he was fantastic. And so one night he rang up um, um, a, a, a call a call center for rent boys. And so he asked this person to come over. And the guy comes over, and it was the guy in the park. So it was like, oh, my God, I've, I've struck gold. And so they just had a lovely evening. And it wasn't all just about sex, you know. I mean, it was about, you know, male sexuality is very different than feminine sexuality, isn't it? And so that, you know, man on man is very different than woman on woman. And I often think, you know, that that um, women-women relationships are like, like almost too many wombs. You know, there's a lot of cats and chickens and eggs and flowers. And it's it's quite lovely. But with men, it's very rough. It's rough stuff, yeah? And so I guess that's part of what that's about is the attraction to the danger. And a lot of men were attracted to that danger. And then the AIDS epidemic came out. And now I have a surviving brother who actually is not AIDS. AIDS. He's HIV and he's been HIV for, let's say, 40 years. And he is one of the, one of the test cases of why certain people don't slip into AIDS, etc., and part of the thing they've come up with in the research in Canada is, is that if your First Nations or, or Native American, as they call them in the States, or Indian, I don't know about Aboriginals and other cultures, though, but they uh, tend not to cross over into the AIDS virus, which is really an interesting thing because we're all part Indian. Was that, was that useful and not rude? I just love it. I just love to hear that there is no interception and it's just a planet will spend more time there. Like mostly like when you think about the faster moving planet, I do have yeah, yeah. planet Saturn intercepted in the fourth house. So, uh -huh. and it's ruling my hate house. So I was thinking about the lineage, you know, about the family. Oh boy, boy, you've got a big lesson in your family. Oh, I certainly do. Oh, man, have they ever weighed on you or what? I mean, have you emigrated? Well, actually, um, I do have also Uranus squaring the node. And, and Mark oh. just told me at some point that I have broken the karmic link in the family. Well, actually, you were born to do that. Whether or not you can, I'm not sure. However, you're definitely born to act, disrupt and, 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 you know, break away from the family uh, legacy. And I certainly did. Well, good for you. Because the person I was going to use today, she did the same thing from Italy. She was an amazing woman. And she left by, with her family when Uranus went over her midheaven. And, uh, and, uh, and she's just had phone calls from her ancestors or from people from, from her family that live in the States that she didn't know existed. Uh, hers is a good chart too, but I, I needed Howard today. I really needed to talk about him. And I'm really glad that that made sense to you because to me, I, if I see a mystery and that's a mystery and I hear some kind of dogma, I say, okay, get rid of the dogma, get rid of everything. Just try and figure out what it does. And that's what I've come up with. Well, thank you so much. It's such an interesting coincidence that, you know, because this guy has really marked me as, as a person. Like when I start studying astrology, I really connect with all of his, his books and I got them all. And I just you know, that, I'm, I, I know we're almost closing, but the thing is, I want to say, um, I'm really glad to hear that. And I think he's one of the best writers in plain language with exceptional understanding and, and wisdom underneath, yeah? And I don't, I've never heard anybody say uh, anything except what you've just said. Honestly, I, I'm not trying to diminish your uniqueness, but the fact is, is that, that it, you're just describing who he was. Everybody thinks that about Howard's books. Everyone thinks that. And when he was talking, and the horrible thing is I was able to get a whole bunch of C, of a uh, uh, copies of my lectures. The AA, the British Astrological Society has an incredible archive of everything recorded for the conferences. And I had got up five of mine, but I only got one of Howard's. And um, God, it was awful. I mean, I mean that I don't have, I have one, two of his voice.
But as a writer, I mean, that, that's how he stayed alive. He took steroids and for six months, he, he actually wrote uh, the um, transcription of Richard Eidemann's books, who died in 1986 of AIDS. Okay, and when and Liz Green was supposed to do it, but she just defaulted on the whole thing. So Howard said, "This is great. Pump me full of steroids. I'll do it." Six months later, he's written two of uh, of Richard Eidemann's books, which were published, and so that kept him going because he looked at Richard and he said, "You know, give me life. Give me life. I'll do everything I can for you." Mm. So he believed in ghosts too. Ghosts. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you. Okay, Erin, thank you so much. We've, um, we've got about three minutes, if you wish. Oh, if anybody has anything they'd like to put in. Yeah. Anybody, any questions or comments? That was uh, brilliant, Erin. Uh, most, uh, a lot of what you were talking about as far as, you know, like his family, the hoarding and, and just his work oh. and everything that he needed to do. I, I saw that to me clearly uh, reflected in that, that nodal axis and, the, and that square that- um, Oh, interesting, Wanda. Mars I, and Pluto square to the nodal axis. Yeah. yeah, when you talk about hoarding, you see that word, you see, this is what I love, why I like feedback, is people tell me stuff that I, I didn't say. And like the moon in Taurus, square Mars, Saturn and Pluto would have been so against hoarding like Howard dressed very simply he was like a gentleman I mean he was absolutely you know we were naughty like mad but he was a gentleman but the whole hoarding thing like his mother's room used right. to be like a nightmare to him mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I was saying I saw that in the you know in all that stuff opposite he was wounded by his mother's clothing <laughs> moon and Taurus her stuff yeah, yeah. her right. things and she wanted to be free and just have a few, one of each. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved it. Really, it was nice to be able to, to see it, you know, reflected in the chart. I just feel so good that I did his chart today. Hi, Howard. Everybody loves you. <laughs> so, Erin, yes, um, I loved how this chart came to life through your sharings with us. Um, I can see how that first and seventh houses are so important. Uh, with the first house Aquarius being such a great astrologer and then his, you know, gay life being so important to him in the seventh. Um, yeah, uh, he wasn't a political gay, gay though. Whereas like Jim was a political gay, other, you know, he was non-political and, you know, he didn't like pe to be classified. Yeah, sure. That's interesting, isn't yeah, it? And, um, I love how Saturn rules that 12th house and Saturn's found in, in the seventh house, so close to Mars and Pluto. And, you know, that is that very extreme violence in the uh, ancestral family. Yeah. 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 I come, I see he and I were born uh, six months apart and in November 9th of 1947, uh, Mars, Saturn and Pluto were conjunct, but they were not retrograde. By the time it went to April, Mars had gone retrograde and direct, okay? And so that we have Mars at the same degree, 20, and Saturn and Pluto are retrograde, whereas they weren't when I was born, because yeah. I was born with the sun in Scorpio, yeah? In fact, his moon is on my north node, which accounts for your deep friendship. Yeah, Long it was, it was, un, yeah, it, some, one, there was, yeah, it, it was just everything you could possibly imagine, really. Beautiful. And so there, I give it up to Neptune, really. Mm -hmm. I want to say that I am, I am absolutely thrilled with what you're doing with the uh, Evolutionary Astrology Group. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just am amazed, and I think it's fantastic. We love it, too. 
Oh, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you're not like, hating it and sleep. You know what I mean? That would be awful. Oh, my God, we've got to do another bloody workshop. Okay. No, no, we're absolutely, I'm absolutely passionate about this. Absolutely love it. I feel like good. my chart has come alive and I have come alive. I feel embodied. For the first yeah, no, the, you're like me. I was a dynamo in the, in my early days. I, I mean, I still I still am. I'm going to be doing, by the way, I'll be take, being taken on as a an announcement to you guys first is I'm going to be joining the Kepler College faculty. They've asked me to do it, and they want me to do it on archetypal astrology and contemporary wow. practice. Excellent. Beautiful. Erin, yeah, could you please, so. Can you please, do you have the stop share button? Oh, well, no, just not yet. Uh, We'll go back um, to the attendee panel soon. Um, stop. Do I stop sharing now? Well, we can leave this one up. We can leave this one up. I just thought it would be nice to see everybody on the... Uh, oh, I think it would be great too. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, there we are. So we're back. Yay, I can see everybody. Everybody's got muted. Everyone looks Christy. happy. Very happy. Had a good astrological hey. feed. <laughs> So anything yeah. anybody? Everybody's being very contemplative and thoughtful. I think they should thank, thank <laughs> you so that much. was awesome. It was totally awesome, Aaron. Thank you so much. A lot to oh, think about. Sue, thank you. Yeah, I always I always like seeing you here. Thank you. I love seeing you here. Oh, that's so good. Isn't that fun? That was absolutely fascinating, Erin. Thank you very much. Carolyn, thank you. I know it is fascinating. I mean, you know, thanks. Please. I mean, I'm fascinated because I'm fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> like, why wasn't I? I'm so intelligent. I could have been of other things. Why wasn't I? I'm sorry, Max. I just couldn't be a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, Marie, you had something to say? Yes, I was going to say how thankful I am for that lecture. It was really, really an eye-opening, not only on the subject of uh, the lineage, and, but also on ours as portals. And like he has been such a big hero of mine. And I really, I've, I've, I've drink all of his words, you know, like, I mean, it, it's like you say, he was the first one who will talk regular language to present astrology and all of the planet and the way they were working and yeah. it's just amazing like the way he, well, was the he founded the um the uh contemporary astrology series and within a couple of months um they had hunted me because he was sick and i and so that's how i got i became the editor for contemporary astrology series with arcana penguin in london I mean, he, he did so much, you know. I mean, this man was like really something else. Yeah. Yeah, and then teaching for the CPA. I, I mean, he really was the soul. I always said that, you know, kind of Liz was the, 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 the uh, intellect uh, and the, the sort of scholarly type, although Howard was a, you know, he actually graduated summa cum laude from Tufts, which is a very intense university in the United States in the East, very important. And um, he also was the first person and the only person still to this day to pass the Faculty of Astrological Studies grind of a, class, of a course. It's unbelievably rigorous. He wrote the whole thing in one day and he got 100% right. Wow. So, Max, we weren't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to have to wind down now. Erin, thank you so much. That was so brilliant. Incredible. Thank you. Thank it. you. So, unmuting everybody, and uh, we'll see you again. It's not thank you. Um, thank you. Divide and conquer is the problem. It's yeah. assimilation is the problem. <laughs> sure. And that's always been the problem. And that's like what I said, what Philip Roth, Roth writes about at length. And so do a lot of other Jewish <laughs> she authors. She doesn't know him. So it's, okay, I love yeah, this. I mean, this he does great. a great job of it. Are you it, kidding? Too, you know? Are you I mean, kidding? Um, 
the Jewish well, psychiatrists are, are, in books, are in books like that. <laughs> okay, um, well, everybody. Which doesn't make yours invalid. It just means I love it. Up with Jews. Okay. Thank you, Marin. Bye, darling. Bye-bye. Well, you're unique.